so about a year ago, I was sitting at a bar in Hollywood, having a couple of drinks with my friend, Zon Lee. Now, Zon's a really smart guy. He's a futurist. He's got quite a few degrees from Cambridge, MIT, USC, and now he works at a think tank. And he also happens to be my go-to guy when I feel like I'm hitting a career wall. So what was going on at the time was that my book, UX Strategy, had been out for about a year. And it had been doing really well, certainly to my surprise. It's a book about the intersection of UX design and business strategy, and has a framework, and about nine techniques on how to conduct product strategy. And it's written for people who work in different work environments with all kinds of titles, cross-functional teams. And I had also been invited to speak all over the world because of this book. I felt so lucky I got to go to countries like Israel and Hungary and China and get to meet people from all walks of life and learn about the different sort of takes on software design all over the world. And so this was really amazing because I was preaching and speaking and doing UX strategy workshops. And at the same time, my book was the course textbook for this class that I teach at the University of Southern California. The class happens to be in the engineering school. It's called the Viterbi Engineering School. And most of my students are big data scientists and they study cybersecurity, but it also brings students from the business school and the cinema school, so it's a nice cross-functional batch. And I also am lucky because they have me teaching two sections now because the course has been so popular because it attracts people who are interested in UX design who aren't necessarily UX designers, or maybe it's because it's the easy class and they don't have to take tests and learn rote memory. Or maybe it's because the engineers know that when they get out and work in the workforce, they don't want to be bossed around by people like us because they don't have a clue what user research is or how to conduct market research. So all this sounds probably pretty good, except basically what I was doing was teaching and preaching UX strategy, and I wasn't making anything. So I was a little frustrated, because this had gone on for about four years, and I started to feel like a poser. And so this is what I wanted to talk to Zahn about. I said, I'd written this book called UX Strategy, How to Devise Innovative Products, but yet I wasn't doing anything innovative. So he asked me, well, who are the innovators who inspired you? And I said, well, that's easy. Andy Warhol. I loved Andy Warhol. Well, when I went to college, he inspired me so much because he did so many different things. He took pock art and made it so that art became accessible to the masses, pushed graphic design into the fine arts, he made all kinds of weird experimental films that were just completely strange and people walked out of the movie theaters. And he had this factory that brought together all kinds of people to listen to bands like the Velvet Underground, to just hang out and take tons of drugs and, you know, just meld. So he really inspired me and he was a great innovator to me. So then Zahn asked, well, how about somebody who works in tech? And I was like, well, Steve Jobs, RIP. I mean, Steve Jobs, my God. Over the last 40 years, I mean, before he died, he had innovated so much 
you know, he took Steve Wozniak's idea of the first personal computer and put it out there. It was my first computer. And he did things that people, especially engineers, always said was impossible, such as the SE. Like, no, we don't want to make a computer that fits on a yellow page just because you told us to. And he put out all kinds of different devices that who knew that we would be using so much that we can't like even go 15 seconds without like grabbing our back pocket, wondering if something is happening that we might be missing. But what's important is that he took all of these different devices, hardware and software, and put them together so that all the touch points came together using the App Store, using iTunes, and then even putting out things like the Genius Bar, like we heard from Katie before, like truly making the experience of owning the product wonderful from the point that you walked into the store to using the device to become totally addicted. And more importantly, he disrupted tons of business models. He screwed Hollywood over so hard with their movie industry and the music industry, changing it so that we could just download one song instead of having to spend 15 bucks for some stupid fixed format CD. So he really inspired me a lot. And what Apple did that made them so successful, and hopefully they will continue to be somehow without him, is that they always stayed at least two years ahead of their competitors. They always needed to do this, especially because they worked with hardware, and so it was harder for the other companies to keep up. And even though his engineers told him whatever he was envisioning was impossible, he would still try to try to make it and be an innovator and an inventor. And so he inspired me. So then Zahn asked, well, are there any living innovators who inspire you? Perhaps even ones that don't wear a black turtleneck? I love Elon Musk. And I try to dress like my idol sometimes because I am a big poser. But Elon Musk, seriously, is incredible. When he was a teenager, he was inventing video games. He invented Skype before there was Skype with web-based phone calls. Co-founder of PayPal and Solar City, and then of course is Tesla, one of the most beautiful electric cars out there that has set a precedent for all electronic cars. And now he has SpaceX, and they're sending rockets out into outer space and landing them in the ocean or wherever he feels like it. Private company, it's incredible. And so, Zahn was th saying, well, have you heard about his latest concept, which is the Hyperloop? Which had been, he had just released a white paper and it was getting a lot of attention because of this idea that this pod inside this pressurized tube can jettison us from, let's say, Los Angeles to San Francisco in 30 minutes for 20 bucks. This was the big idea. And I was like, hmm, that sounds pretty interesting. He said, well, he, he wrote this, o this white paper and it's open source. Now, for those of you who don't know open source, I mean, we know that it's basically around code. And it's this idea, kind of like skateboarding, where people share ideas and collaborate together. They look at each other's tricks and then build upon them. And they completely remix different ideas so that the end result is something that's collaborative and ultimately benefits everybody. 
And so I love that his idea was open source and he put it out there. And there are two companies in Los Angeles where I live that were actually pursuing this concept. One of them was called uh, Hyperloop Trans Transportation Systems and then Hyperloop One. But this one, HTT, was interesting to me because they were using crowdsourcing as their business model. Now, crowdsourcing is basically this idea where you're gonna bring together people from, let's say, all over the world so that you can tap the minds of the greatest engineers or designers and bring them together so that they could take a service or concept forward and bring their all ideas so that people can benefit from it. And so I wanted to learn more about this, so I started researching it and realized it was this dude, Dirk Aldborn, who ran this company. And that he was saying things all over the media, dropping these words, user experience. And I was like, I gotta talk to this dude. So I decided I needed to stalk him. So I went to LinkedIn, typed in his name, and said, hey, Dirk, would you like a free copy of my book, UX Strategy? If you give me your mailing address, I'll send it to you. That's always my opening line. And by the way, if you happen to be looking for a UX strategist or designer, I would love to be a consultant for you because I think this innovation of Hyperloop is rad. 17 seconds, he writes me back and he says, well, everybody on the team is working a minimum of 10 hours a week for stock options. We'd love to have you on board. Just write this guy. And I was like, great, stock options. <laughs> you know, I've been working with stock options since I had my dot-com company, you know, back in the 90s. You know, and as my dad loves to say about stock options is, you know, Jamie, 10% of nothing equals nothing. And I was like, Dad, they're not even offering me 0.01% of something. So, you know, this is something I want to do because I really am interested in getting involved. But the real issue was what the heck can we do with 10 hours a week of time if we're trying to reinvent the f future of transportation? That's just not enough time. So I decided what I needed to do was crowdsource it to my two classes that were just starting up at USC. I had 40 students who, some were in there for the easy grade and some were in there to get involved and really learn UX strategy, UX strategy techniques and apply them to a real world project. So I sent out a blackboard notice. Hey, anybody want to get involved? You could still get an A, of course, if you just show up and do all the assignments. No rote memory for this class. But we're going to have these Skype sessions once a week, and we're going to divide you guys into groups for the five different value propositions that they are interested for us to pursue. And you're going to have to work as teams on these projects. And luckily, 20 out of 40 of these students volunteered. So we are off to the races. And we had to solve a really big problem. This is the big picture. Well, it was Los Angeles on a good day. It sucks. Commuting in Los Angeles sucks. It divides the city where I was born into the city of two cities. There's the east side and the west side, and we hate each other. I don't like to go to Silicon Beach, and they don't like to go to the east side. I don't know why, but I'm happy for them not to come over to where I am. And, but the bottom line is, when we sit in our cars, we are wasting our lives, unless maybe we're listening to an audible book. But most of the time, we're just probably getting fat, because we're not moving, we're not exercising, we're not with our families, we're not with our friends, we're not productive. And that's just the car part. It's worse than that. Transportation is more than just the car. 
think about longer journeys where we're trying to travel, let's say, from, let's say, Los Angeles, where I had to go from my house, and I took an Uber to the airport, and then the airport to here, and then some weird taxi to there. And all of this had to be coordinated, and thankfully it was coordinated by Sweden, so everything was perfect. But when I go to China, things don't work out so well. And so there were a lot of things we had to solve for. So the first thing we needed to figure out was the passenger app, which was how were people going to be able to put, book a trip from point A to point B, door to door, seamlessly, regardless of whether they were going to use this fictitious, fictitious transit system that hasn't really been invented yet. They've only done prototypes. So this included being able to book everything from one mode of transportation to the next and for it to be able to share the data all the way across the experience. And so I had all the students, just like the students who are working on their own projects, apply the techniques that I teach that are part of UX strategy, where we start not with the solution, but with the problem. What is the problem we have to solve? Have them say, this is the problem, and then say, well, who is this persona? that you think, who is this customer? Not the old school personas that you might be uh, thinking about from the late 90s, but the ones that, have, that Alan Cooper put out in his third book called Provisional Personas. When we don't have time, when we need 20 minutes to knock out a persona and take a bunch of guesses and mash that up with Steve Blank's concept of customer discovery and go out and validate it so that we have an actual customer segment represented by this persona and validate that they actually have this problem. So I send my students out in teams of two and they have to go find this customer and validate that yes, this is a problem before jumping into a solution, which is tough for engineers because they just want to solve the problem. And then they have to do business strategy. They have to conduct competitive research and look for all the different digital services or products out there competing against the value proposition and make sure that there's opportunity in the marketplace and make recommendations and then from there create a prototype. And we use different prototyp prototyping tools. And so that was the first one. The second one was the concept of a ride-sharing app. We've all probably taken an Uber or Lyft. But think about it. From the perspective of these ride providers, they're kind of like lost in the system. They don't know when a ton of people might be coming into the airport or a concert's getting out. They have no insight. You know, some, the, the apps are getting more advanced, but still, in terms of knowing when the surges are and making it so they can make the most money, they're still kind of limited. And it's also just limited to drivers of cars again, darn it. But we went out, it's easy to interview Uber drivers because they're kind of trapped and they want five stars. Get validation that there's a problem. Oh yeah, there's a problem. Do a competitive analysis. Look at all the, all the different people who are in the different countries, seeing how they do it, and then create a prototype. But this one we are looking at, well, what if we are providing things, and this one just shows a car and a van and minivan, but what about tuk-tuks and shashanks and all these different boats? And imagine that anyone could be a ride provider in the future. Why not? So the third concept was the advertising platform. And this, I think, was the most innovative. And the problem here is that even with the best advertising platform out there now, which is Facebook in terms of targeting advertising, you cannot target a passenger from point A to point B because you don't know where they are because of geolocation. And so we thought about the person who's running these ads, a brand strategist or someone who's running the marketing department, talk to them. They're like, oh yeah, this thing is effed up, man. This is a problem, fix it, please. We looked at the competitors who were doing targeted advertising, and I don't know if you used Waze. I use Waze in Los Angeles constantly because the traffic's so bad. 
And it's interesting, but it's like you'll be driving and all of a sudden, you know, it's really packed and an ad comes up and it's like, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm like, what? Crash. You know, like, this is not a good solution. It's targeted, but it's not relevant for sure. And there's other interesting solutions out there, like this idea for this bicycle where you can just get on it for free and ride and it's gonna just project ads to the people while that bike's driving by. And this is the big idea because what we want ultimately is to create these modes of transportation that people can take that are subsidized if they opt into the advertising. Maybe they play a game, maybe they watch a trailer, but all of a sudden the ride is reduced or maybe even free because they allow themselves to be uh, marketed against. This is the big idea for the business model. And so they created a different means for placing ads that involved picking different modes of transportation and where the passenger would be at different points along the way, incorporating demographics, psych psychographics, and geolocation. All possible now. Then came the stakeholder dashboard. This is the toughest one. Because as we know, most of the systems that have been around for planes and trains are legacy systems. They are totally outdated. And train managers and pilots, people trying to figure out like what the heck's going on if a plane's like sitting in the runway, you know, or just think of all the different issues that happen because they're not sharing data. And so we had to find these guys and they aren't sitting at the Santa Monica mall, you know, drinking their cappuccino. So we stalked them on LinkedIn and validated that they had this problem and then looked at all of their interfaces for managing their systems, which were impossible to find just out there on the web, but you can actually go to SlideShare and there'll be some goofball from some company who's of course bragging about their latest blah 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 and download the slide share and grab the interfaces and see kind of what's the latest and greatest in terms of transportation systems and this is how we were able to learn about them and create a prototype where we could sort of envision what it would be like if regardless of if you're a train driver or a taxi driver or a, a pilot and you wanted to know well where are you know, all these things gonna converge, you know, maybe it could make transportation safer, maybe it could optimize it for us. So that if, let's say, one train, you know, is delayed, we could hop on another train because they're sharing data. And all of this is possible now. The last one was the exciting one, was the onboard entertainment system. And we see this when we get on a plane, it's on the back of the seat, and some systems are more advanced than others where you can actually you know, connect a USB drive and maybe uh, watch movies and listen to music. But we were thinking about something far more futuristic. And so my students talked to business travelers and asked them what they wanted because they're traveling for business. You can bet I was working on this presentation all the way here from LA and I had to pull out my laptop, but this would be impossible on a Hyperloop because you're bolted in like a roller coaster ride and you can't really pull your laptop down and jack it into the back of a seat. It's still to be determined if you're even gonna be able to get up and pee. So, of course, everybody was like, yes, this can be improved. And we looked at all the different systems out there. This is conducting business strategy, looking at not just the UX of the products, but the business aspects of it. How much funding do they have? When's the last time they designed it? When were they founded? When the last time was it updated? Are they leveraging social media? All of these different attributes. So we could figure out if there was an opportunity space for this. And then create a competitive brief, which is something that you can show to stakeholders or venture capitalists if you're trying to raise funding, showing that you look to the competition I have a toolkit that I created that goes with my book to help people along with this so they understand how to look at a grid and make sure they get all the attributes and analyze them. And then we created that prototype. 
And this was a really great experience for my class. By the very end, Dirk showed up and watched all the presentations. And we got to have this real life experience you know, for a real product, well, a real fake product <laughs> that could eventually come out in two or five years, but we got to envision the future using UX strategy techniques. So these are the takeaways from that experience. The first thing is that no matter where you are in your career path, you should always have both mentors and inspiring heroes to keep you motivated in case you hit a career wall and you're not sure. Secondly, if you want to work on innovative products, you need to position yourself as a contributor. It's not about the money. Truly, the journey is a reward. And lastly, by applying a UX strategy methodology to futuristic concepts, even engineering students can attempt to transform the world for the common good. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Jamie. Let's have one of those later on. <laughs> so, Jamie, I, I totally share your compassion in being innovative and really, you know, work on things that can make a difference for real and, and being sustainable for the future. So, but I was thinking, you, you mentioned the need to work for the products and services that really, like, yeah, makes a change for the world, sort of. And say you're not really working with that, like today. Say you're more really working on an ordinary product or service. Can you apply this way of thinking uh, that you're proposing, like in just an ordinary work? Well, apply the methodology yeah. or just apply the, uh, the idea of that you want to ultimately work on products for the good of mankind. I was, just, I was thinking more like, can you apply this methodology like when you're working on just whatever? I hope so. I mean, otherwise, I don't know why my book would be that successful. But yes, I, um, uh, a cousin of mine runs a hair salon, which is a brick and mortar, uh, obviously, uh, business. And she uses the book because she needs to do customer discovery and she needs to do business strategy. So I think this idea of trying to uh, apply you know, experience design with business strategy is applicable to everybody. But especially for people like us, I think it's important that before we move into the design, you know, in the implementation phase, that we do, you know, what's called the minimum viable product and make as many rapid prototypes as possible to put in front of customers to make sure that we're on the right path before we spend all the stakeholders or clients' money on something that ultimately people don't want. That's a good one. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you so much. And here's a gift you, for everybody. you.